I want to kind of introduce our, our, uh, our, our session leader today, uh, Samyaka Bryant. I think I was trying to think when we first met, I think we were struggling against gang injunction. Yeah. In, in Oakland. So yeah. it's been a minute. So I'm very, um, glad that uh, our paths are crossing here as well. Um, Y'all, I hope a lot of you know Sinyaka and his work, particularly in um, Malcolm X grassroots movement, yeah. um, the African People's Organization, and we had a great conversation last week about pulling out some of the um, particulars of these chapters and bringing them up to some of the stuff that's going on now. Um, we couldn't be more happy to have Sinyaka here when we first started thinking of uh, doing these sessions, one of the first meetings that came up. And I think we actually, even before, when we first started at the center doing this session, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about how this might be a good thing to try to do this time. So, without further ado. So, that previous conversation kind of sets me up very well. <laughs> All right, so firstly, I wanted to talk about a little bit of where I'm coming from in this. Right? So I'm, a, I'm what you call a revolutionary nationalist. You know, we still exist. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's the, that's the kind of politics of the next grassroots movement and the new African People's Organization are rooted in it. Right? And when we look at this period of reconstruction, it was the height of black nationalism in the United States. Um, like, and I think what I, what I kind of want to do, I'm going to go into a little bit of more like the political lineage of revolutionary nationalism in, in contrast um, in contrast that with um, the, the kind of military um, repression against reconstruction and against the self-determined efforts um, of, of black folks but also the other oppressed nationalities too. So I just contrast I always start back a couple centuries before we, <laughs> right? Context-wise, when Africans first came here in, in, as far as enslaved Africans, first came here in 1526, South Carolina on the Kiwi River, brought over by Spaniards um, who had recently colonized Haiti. Um, within six months, um, the 150 um, Africans that were captured rebelled, set up the first Maroon Society on the North American mainland, right, and also set up the first military alliance with the indigenous peoples here, right. So that's from the beginning, right, six months into our state here in this empire, right. And so the lineage goes back, goes back far. And when we look at the period just before the Civil War, right? Just before the Civil War, you have the war against Mexico. You have all the wars that happened with the indigenous peoples here. Okay. And then you also have a period of about 100 and, well, more than 100 years, 100 about 30 years of like active slave rebellions. Right, that weren't just like just individual little rebellions popping off here and there. Right, they were like coordinated military attacks. Right, um, we in our in our tradition call them the Gulf Wars. Um, the Seminole Wars are connected to that. Right, and the Seminole Wars, the second one, which ends in 1856. Um, is the large results in the largest emancipation of Africans before the Civil War. Right. And so it's important to 
place those those conflicts as part of the part of what what started to, to lift up the contradiction around the need to end slavery, right? In a particular way, when you're getting attacked, hit, hit after hit, you got Nat Turner's and your Gabriel Prosser's, Denmark this, and you got the when you look at like the Underground Railroad, right? And the sophistication of that, right? And it gets that sophistication because of military training, right? And not just you know, it's not these things that don't just appear out of nowhere, right? And a lot of that training actually comes from Haitians that had the military experience in the Haitian Revolution. A lot of them came over here and, and trained us. We owe a lot, a lot to Haiti. Right? So I just wanted to like, kind of start off there, right? When you look at, I, want, I think I want to play the, the Tunis Channel video. We'll get that queued up, but in the in the chapter, um, the white proletarian, right proletarian in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, um, Du Bois talks about. Um, he briefly mentions Tunis Campbell, right? Who is one of our, as far as New African independence movement goes, he's one of our forebears, right? It's a little brief mention here, but I kind of want to lift him up a little bit to kind of show what some of the motion was immediately after, you know, the child of slavery. Even as Lee surrendered to Grant, scores of newly emancipated men and women were arriving at St. Catharines in the Sea Islands of Georgia. Under Sherman's Field Order 15, these abandoned lands would be theirs. Leading them was 53-year-old Tunis G. Campbell from New Jersey. For years, Campbell had worked tirelessly as an abolitionist, a preacher, an educator, and political organizer. With the help of Secretary of War Stanton, Campbell got himself appointed superintendent for the Union-occupied islands in Georgia. There are a lot of people in 1865 who are trying to tell blacks what freedom is and tell them what they ought to be doing. Campbell reflects the impulse, we should really determine ourselves what we're doing. Independence from white control, that's critical to their definition of what freedom is. It just happens that on St. Catherine's Island, you can create such a thing. The whites have all fled. Sherman has given out land. So the opportunity to create an independent black community exists. We left with rations and a few families, and at Hilton Head got more, Campbell wrote. And Savannah loaded us as deep as we could swim. These deserted lands had been at the heart of the South's rice-growing empire. As Campbell arrived to the island and they put the gangplank down, the island was overgrown. It's been looted by Union naval forces. The seagrass is high. There are rattlesnakes. There are alligators. He can see the slave cabins. They're also in great disrepair. Immediately upon arriving and assessing the situation there, he writes to the American Missionary Association asking for seed, asking for plows, sweet potatoes to supplement the diet, marriage licenses for the people. And he calls a meeting of the people to explain to them, this is our home. Uh, uh, beginning next week, I will divide up the land into 40 acres for each of you. By June, the settlers had crops in the ground. I have corn, watermelons, citron, onions, radishes, and squash, wrote Campbell. But the rebels have destroyed the sweet potatoes. Do not fail to send them. Send eight number 11 plows, six cultivators, get the improved ones. Tunis Campbell sees the South 
as a kind of new political frontier. He sees himself as a kind of political pioneer to go to that place where this new regime of black political liberty and civil liberty might flourish. Campbell arrived at St. Catharines with his own blueprint for a government. There would be a Congress with eight men in the Senate and 20 in the House of Representatives, a Supreme Court, and Campbell himself as president. He even established a 275-man militia. Order, said Campbell, is heaven's first law. So you've got this tiny little island, 12 miles long, three miles wide, and a government set up to resemble the United States government with a Supreme Court at the top. It's a wonderful, beautiful uh, experiment in, in democracy. And people took to it very well. They liked the idea of having the power to select their leaders and remove them. But at St. Catharines, no one was going to remove Tunis Campbell. On St. Catherine's Island, Tunis Campbell's township was flourishing. Three hundred and sixty nine settlers occupied 54 slave dwellings left from the old days. They grew fruits and vegetables of all kinds. But what they wanted were schools. There is one sin that slavery committed against me that I will never forgive, remembered one man. It robbed me of my education. Before the Civil War, maybe no more than 10 to 15 percent of the black population in the South was literate. To learn how to read was a revolutionary act. They understood that it was necessary if they were to take their place as freed people within the Union, that they have the rudiments of education to survive. After the war, freedmen who had secretly educated themselves quickly opened schools in warehouses, on barges, even in old slave markets. And the Freedmen's Bureau and Northern missionaries built thousands more throughout the South. At St. Catharines, Campbell used his own savings to bring teachers down from the North. Then he called on his wife, Harriet, in New York. He writes a letter to Harriet, says, bring the sons down. Uh, we're going to establish the schools. We're on an island of our own. There are no white people here, and we're going to, to lift up uh, children. Uh, bring all the primers you have, and please join us. This is the first time he's seen his wife and sons uh, in about two years. Harriet and Tunis taught side by side with Northern teachers. Campbell reported that 80 children and adults on St. Catharines and 60 on nearby Sapelo Island were enrolled in schools. More than a thousand students attended Campbell's makeshift academies. The adults are being taught at night. They need to deal with white people more as equals. And to do that, they have to be literate. White planters watching from the mainland resented the schools and the entire settlement. Not just because the land had been seized from one of their own, but because of Campbell's ambition and independence. People like Campbell were viewed as black people out of their place. He can think for himself in ways that whites find hard to believe that a black person could think. This means, then, that history has somehow spun out of control.
By June 1865, Jacob Waldberg, the white planter who had owned St. Catharines, was back in Georgia. He demanded that Campbell get off his land. The planters are holding up deeds to the islands that are 200 years old or 150 years old. They said, no, wait a minute. Uh, this is a nation of laws, and see, my great granddaddy had this deed. And yours comes from a possessory title given to you in time of war for abandoned lands. How does that affect my promise of property rights under the Constitution of the United States? Waldberg got his answer. St. Catherine's Congress passed a law forbidding any white person from setting foot on the island. Campbell's militia stood ready to enforce it. So, immediately after slavery, right, we moved for self-determination. Um, what happens afterwards, the Union Army um, comes in with black soldiers. Right? They knew they came in with white soldiers that had been bucking. <laughs> you know, that had been open warfare. But by using the black soldiers, it wasn't going to be a way. Just after the Civil War, and just you know, as folks, you know, were making their move towards towards their liberation, they weren't going to be fighting each other. Right? So they used that tactically. You know, and folks were removed from the from the island. Right? Um, and so the planter got his plantation back, right? and then Tunis Campbell, you know, moves on to the to like the kind of reconstruction of the Georgia government, right, and the conventions and all that, right, and so. We want to kind of connect some of that with some current stuff, right? So, who, who here is familiar with our, you know, the victory just happened in Jackson? Right? Yeah. We got some good news. We got some good news, right? So, Comrade Chokwe, Antar, and Mumba, we call him Antar to differentiate him from his dad. You know, our late Comrade Bob Chokwe. Um, so he won the the Democratic primary um, in Jackson, Mississippi, for mayor. Okay. Um, in this is in Jackson, in Jackson, you know, if you're winning the Democratic primary, you're pretty much guaranteed to be, to be mayor. Okay. Um, and so he's he's running um, in the tradition of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Um, which is also an extension of, of the, the political tradition that comes out of this, the experimentations with you know, self-determined democracy. And so, the tactic-wise, or strategy, let's say strategy-wise, you know, the, the move to use some aspects of the state to open up space, you know, is like you know that's part of our that's part of our political tradition. Right? So Tunis Campbell joins the the Bureau for Refugees, Freedmen, and uh, what was it? Amanda. And Daniel Lance. He joins it. Right? He's pick, pick back from Robin Kelly from last time. Right? He joins that strategic. Right, because he knows that that's what's going to open up some space for for his political maneuvers. Right. You know, and so when we look at uh, you know Antar's Antar's victory in Jackson, right, it's part of our overall Jackson Cush plan, right, and it's one aspect of the plan. Right, so we want to have somebody in the in the seat of power in the city, you know, kind of open up space. You know, we had we had Chokwe in city council. Right? We were running this is in 2013. We were running Chokwe for for mayor. He had just been in city council. We were running June Hardwick 
another MHCM comrade um, for um, for a, a city council position. She ended up losing that one. Um, the Chuck went and appointed her as a judge. Wow. Um, and you know we we you know through through the use of the people's assembly process and you know, like the democratic structures that we build up so that people have a, a, a means of expressing their power outside of the outside of the, the kind of formal you know political system um, still engaging it but it's like a it's particularly built up to be an outside an outside force um, so I do that we were able to create the mechanism to provide the checks you know, our comrades that, that went into those seats of power. And, and so with the Jackson Cush plan, we got open up space for the for our political maneuvering. We've got um, a whole pillar around cooperative economics. Right? So we set up Cooperation Jackson out there, you know, as an economic institution. Right? Um, and one thing is that I don't know if folks are familiar with um, the book Collective Courage. Anybody familiar with it? Yeah, so this is Jessica Gordon um, Nempart. I'm probably butchering her last name. But, but um, that book is about the history of worker cooperatives amongst, amongst black people, right? Going from, going from the Susus in Africa, right, to mutual aid societies, all kinds of different cooperatives. And, um, you know, Fanny Hamer is advocating for cooperatives, boys advocating for cooperatives, right? And, and so we continue, we continue in that, that kind of legacy, right? Um, and so we want to use the, the Office of the Mayor to provide resources and training to open up the cooperative businesses and, the, and expand that out. Um, and then there's the, the expanding of the democratic institutions and people's assemblies and stuff like that. And using the assemblies to help guide the, guide the political um, initiatives of the mayor, to help guide the, um, the production that happens through cooperatives, right? And so it's, you know, that's what we're experimenting with, right? And so we definitely invite all y'all to come on down to Jackson, Mississippi, you know, part of history and help us out. We need all hands on deck. <laughs> all, right. all hands on deck. Yeah. Um, when is the journal? June 6th. June 6th. So, oh, no, so, then we'll be back and then we'll, you know, we'll have to struggle against the state government. <laughs> you know, and so that brings us back, back here, like the interference that comes you know, both military, militarily, but then also politically, you know, around the motions around self-determination. So you've got, you've got the clan, right? You've got the, you've got like the, the northern, northern capitalists coming on down and trying to, try to, you know, bribe folks and all this sort of thing. You've got the, you've got the, the planner aristocrats. You know, everybody. You got the, you got the, you got the former overseers and the police officers and you know, poor, poor white folks. You got know, all these different class, classes and class interests, all, all working to kind of interfere. One thing they have in common, right, is the interference with self determination of of the Africans and the other oppressed nations around too. Right, that's the that's the one thing that unifies them. Right. And so you look at uh, I know y'all talked about um, President Johnson a little bit in some of the previous some of the previous things. And like in, you know, he comes up kind of representing saying that he's representing the interests of the poor whites. Right. Very similar to Trump. <laughs> as far as like the ego, the, the class, the, the classes that make up the social base, um, you know, the, 
you know, very, very, very similar to the times that we're in. And, and using his, his positioning um, in the presidency to mobilize against um, what's perceived to be you know, the undoing of the world. <laughs> you know? So it's the same, same sort of thing. It's like, you know, you have a period of advance, right? And you have a period of counter-revolutionary activity that follows it, right? It's like that, that ebb and flow. And so we just had to make that, right? I'm gonna play something very traumatic for you next. Mm -hmm. Very, very traumatic. Right. And we can start to have a discussion about some of the different class interests um, to cue up the cue up the horror. So one. You're using our language, right? Right. Yes, ma'am. What about this guy? Um, didn't he try to form a white student union at Towson a few years ago? And he caused a major controversy on their campus. I remember him doing the media rounds. Yeah, I think this is the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it shows a certain level of sophistication, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right. They're using the languages of mass movements because they know that stuff works, right? They're using our language, they're seeing all the people in the streets. They come out in support of things, you know? I mean, the Nazis are using the word comrade. You know what I mean? Like, what's going on? Right? So you've got that. You've got um, the language around international solidarity, but it's international in the sense of just the other white nations, right? You've got that, right? You've got the, the language around um, self-preservation, self right? Right, the, the sense that they feel like they're, they're the ones that are under threat, right? It's all the same stuff, same stuff from from the 1860s. They feel like they're under threat. They have to mobilize, mobilize their forces and stuff for the defense of their nation. You know, um, because they see they see the shifts happening in the world. Right? And so we've got Jackson, Mississippi, you know, chance to build a real actual sanctuary city. Right? You know, move to try to make some liberated territory move towards that. Right? And then at the same time, you have this in the horizon, right? this in the background, right? That we're going to have to directly contend with. Right? You know, we got self defense training in their conferences, rural survival training in their conferences, right? Military training. It's serious, right? It's not, it's not a play thing, right? So when we talk about the, the history of our national liberation struggles, right? It goes there. It goes to, you know, it goes to conflict, right? So the, the right to, to self-defense, you know, being tied to, you know, the right to self-determination is like a critical thing to uphold right now, it's period. Right? You see what's coming. Right? You see what's already been happening. All right, so what I kind of want to do, if there, I want to, I kind of want to break all of the groups. Right, and did everybody get the, the steady, the steady questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then raise your hand if you think. Yeah. yeah. One of the comrades made a, um, a good point about um, some of the way I was framing some of these questions. Um, when I was saying white working class in there, Comrade mentioned that um, the way the boys was talking about it, right, it's not quite the white working class. There's the white working class is included, yes, but then there's, there's that sector of, of, of white workers 
right, that don't represent industrialized labor yet, right? So it's not a, you know, so it's like a, a pre-like industrial, you know, kind of, kind of uh, class of white folks, but still, you know, still involved in the, in the oppression of, and ex economic exploitation of others, right? but, a, but a different kind of a class. And one, uh, are folks familiar with the with the book uh, Settlers: Mythology of the White Proletariat? Jason Kai, one of the best U.S. history books, in my opinion. You know, it needs some updating, but like it's really good, really good. Um, as far as um, understanding the the what what like the class interests are of the different different sectors of the settler nation. Um, yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. But let's um, let's break folks off. Y'all split it how you want um, and just discuss these things and then we can like have a, you know, for that kind of group discussion. Talked about 
the power of the what you were saying Sinatra, earlier around the like the upending of the world or the order as people saw, saw it. So people would literally go against what was materially best for them or like in, in order to hold on to an order of the world that they saw as to be true. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to add to this, um, folks are, are folks familiar with the Amistad case? Mm -hmm. right. So, Comrade Sinke um, and his, his comrades were um, kidnapped by slavers from Sierra Leone, um, captured, um, had a, a rebellion on the ship, the ship lands in the United States, you know, and they're they're caught and there's a whole you know court case in the Supreme Court about their status as are they are we gonna have them enslaved or are we gonna send them back to Africa? So at the time the transatlantic slave trade during the time was illegal. Right? So you have the domestic slave trade here, which is you know how you know, it's one of the things that um, the domestic slavery is basically like what the slave industry was like here, right, during that time. But one of the things that comes out of the Amistad case, and I'm going to connect this to the 14th Amendment in a minute, right, um, the Amistad case says that those Africans were free, right, and as free people, they have the right to return back home, right. Um, then you get the passage of the 14th Amendment. One of the clauses in the 14th Amendment right, is that um, citizenship is conferred to people that were born in the United States. Right? You see where I'm going with this. Right? So during the time, you know, there's no, there's no, no real like, way to really tell how many Africans in the United States were actually born in Africa during the time they were caught up in the that that you know the transatlantic slave trade. Right? And so on one hand you could look, and this is kind of like where we come from in the new African independence movement. So it's problem problematizing the 14th Amendment a little bit. Right? In our liberation movement, we look at the 14th Amendment as a violation of our self-determination. Right. They were having all these conventions and everything and rebuilt these states, but nobody ever asked us what we wanted. Mm -hmm. right. The club site that we're trying to organize for should have happened then. Right. And there's always been the three, three um, kind of strategies. One, integration. And not just integration with the Europeans, integration with the natives, integration with the Mexicans, integration with the Canadians. Right. Right, integration into another another like, political structure, another national structure. Right. Second, the second one was a return to Africa. Right. So you have like Martin Delaney and folks like that organizing um, before the Civil War. You got Martin Delaney is like one of our quote unquote forefathers. Right. I've got him on my Facebook picture right now. Right. But he went to Liberia for the Civil War and got agreements with the chiefs there for repatriation for anybody that they, they could, you know, that they could liberate and get back. Right. Um, so there was that. Right. And then you have the folks that want to set up their own independent state. Right. Now our relationship to the United States should have been figured out then by us, right? Not, you know, composed. Right. So this, that's just the, mm -hmm. that's what the, I was trying to get at with the question. So like the pieces that y'all were talking about, as far as like the question of status is like legit, right? You do have like the different experiments that people are doing to, to exercise their self-determination. You have, you know, efforts at re-enslavement. You have, you know, folks, folks like running away, getting their land by any means they could. Right? You have all that, so. Right in the right now. Second group, which I'll talk about. <laughs> <laughs>
Gentlemen behind you. Why me? We talked, I can start some things. We were building off of the sort of like four categories that you um, put out. So our question was, what were some of the political aspirations of black people during the reconstruction period? What were the implications of these aspirations? Are any of these aspirations the same? And if so, why? And in what ways have these political aspirations been worked on in subsequent eras? Um, so we kind of started from the um, ones that you laid out of like land, education, labor, and oh man, yeah. political power. Um, and did some like tracing of those over time, um, including thinking about like literally the same struggles for those being like waged over and over again in different periods as they were granted, taken away, compromised, etc. Um, and added a couple of to the couple to those of aspirations. So like one of them was about like the stuff that was more about like um, self determination at the family level of like. Um, being able to be recognized and preserved as families, and then also um, the work that was done during that period, and then con like continued till today about like decriminalization and like um, sort of like taking away some of the repressive power of the state for punishment. Um, other people want to add things? Well, I think there was a part of the question that was sort of, um, you know, what, how was this? what was the implications of this mm -hmm. and the implications of it being carried on was basically revolution i mean it was like self-determination which was why there was such a huge kickback against mm -hmm. all of those things mm -hmm. happening right. other thoughts on the group for you all right thanks okay group three our question was, what were the respective political aspirations of the white working class and white capitalists during the Reconstruction period, and how these aspirations changed? I can start. I mean, when we talk about white working class and white capitalists being different, and also there was a difference between the white capitalists from the north versus white capitalists from like former planters from the south. But. Um, we're also all behind. It's a little low reading, so it's, it's very skim, uh, very surface level. But we have the white working class. I mean, they just kind of want to like upward mobility, similar to now. It felt like um, in, in job security, the white capitalists, either side, both like from the north and from um, the south, they kind of just don't continue to want to control, want to be able to have capitalism in whatever form they preferred. Um, I would touch a little bit like just having enough, trying to give enough um, rights and or and or having to accept suffrage um, and really just similar to now trying to make people feel like they have enough rights that they're like, oh good, we're good, but really still having to have, have control of people. And yeah, that being like the, because they didn't have like the economic fix of slavery, then there's the political fix of power over black people being, yeah, controlling voting and like exactly how much, and we kind of talked about, like now there's control over like who gets to vote and how that differs from like region to region, whether it's about like land ownership or who actually gets to the polls and is mm -hmm. like intimidated or harassed or killed, or like now like who is not eligible because of felonies or convictions and, um, and so that maintenance of the power structure um, was also like white capitalists wanted to maintain power over white poor folks and working class folks. Um, and yeah, the aspirations, there were political aspirations of the white working class to have a political power through like unions trade councils mm -hmm. and there was like a debate amongst trade councils about how uh, integration like for like separate trade councils of like black workers would give them more power or um, falsely make them less powerful which is like the missed opportunity that the boys talked about. 
So uh, from then until now, it does get more complicated, but it's not like that legacy completely disappeared. Mm -hmm. right. So there's the, the question of how people are sustaining themselves, right? Where do those resources come from, right? So I'm positive when put something out there, right? One of the things, as far as, this is like a, this is National Liberation Movement, Domestic Latin National Liberation Movement strategy. Old school, right? So one, we would say the white working class settlers, right? They get their bread and butter, their comforts from the oppression of all the other nations around them, right? Not just, not just the, the, um, like militarily or whatever, right? But like there's profits that come in, right? They kind of, you know, folks are able to have their cell phones because people in Congo are enslaved today, mm -hmm. right? You know, cell phone charges, you know, charge your, the amount of money you pay on your cell phone bill, it's partly because you got a lot of prisoners and stuff, but, you know, at AT&T, you know, in the jails, you know, keeping costs down for the, for the business, right? You've got the acquisition of large tracts of land from one ocean to the next, right? That opens up the you know the ability to control trade over the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, right? For the empire, right? Now, strategy-wise, right? When when you are able to have a class of folks that kind of like reap the benefits of conquest, right? The material benefits of conquest. It's very hard, you know, for that group of people, you know, to to rise up, you know, against the force that's that's paying them off, basically. Right? And that's a term, there's a term called the labor aristocracy, right? It kind of hints towards some of that. That settler's book is going to be great. Y'all should look at that. So we break some all this down. Right. Now, strategy-wise, how do you split that loyalty? What would have to happen to break up the loyalty of the white working class from the capitalist government? How do you split that up? Organizing. Yeah. <laughs> You have to take away their comfort. You have to take away the thing that is making it possible, right, for for them to live, you know, without that, you know, without those buffers. Really having to deal with the capitalist directly. How do you do that? How do you do that. Liberation struggles. The liberation struggles. All right, so if California, Mexico, California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada break away from the United States and go back into the hands of indigenous folks in the Chicanos, right? What does that do? What does that do to the United States? Puerto Rico, gone. 
Munaf gone, Aslan gone, and all the other nations in Aslan gone, right? Liberated. What happens then? Right? What ha what's, what's potentially what's life like for white workers? Under, under that sort of situation. Mind you, there's like a lot of warfare and everything that happened to make all that possible. But like what, what's the material reality potentially like for white workers in, in a situation like that? Correct. You no longer have all these other oppressed nations to exploit. The capitalists will exploit the white workers more harshly, more directly. That creates the conditions for socialism in the United States. That's what creates the condition for socialism in the United States and North America in general. Right? You can't, you, it's going to be very hard to have a socialism here without, without like, the liberation of those nations. Right? Partially because it's the material basis for the for the profits and the you know the, the kind of the booty from conquest you know it's like it's, you know folks are coming because you know they reap the benefits of the conquest you know which I think which I think about that. Is that taking for granted then the inevitability of like uh, not permanent but like the ever presence of like fear of black power or fear of fear of black people for like that's it seems like it's that's based on like there never being white worker solidarity with the rest of the folks of the world who's actually in their class interest. Right. So are you taking for granted with that or saying as part of the theory that then they're always like white supremacy is always going to win because it's part of capitalism therefore like bind white working class folks like ever tighter to capitalists because they will never find or we can never make a movement that's going to bind people of like all racial backgrounds. So our, our position Generally speaking, is that the as long as the like say the United States like turns socialist tomorrow, like Bernie Sanders wins, whatever, and, and, and institutes like you know social democratic policies and we start moving towards like outright socialism. Right? Okay, that's positive. That's positive, right? But who still controls the land? Who still controls the land, right? What, what democratic institutions are in place that govern how that land is used, right? How those resources are shared, right? right? You can still have socialism here Right, but you're not going to get rid of the national oppression, right? Right, socialism is not going to get rid of national oppression in the United States. Right, it'll turn, it'll warp itself, you know, into into a situation where you still will have, you know, the the socialist state exploiting economically exploiting, you know. And probably dividing the resources differently, yeah, but like, you know, the nations are still going to be exploited, right? If they're not, you know, if their rights of self determination aren't upheld, right? And like the history shows, right, that, you know, folks are going to stick with their class interests, right? You do get a few very good, solid people that break away from that, right? Thank God for them, <laughs> right? But like, as far as classes go, right? As far as classes go, like, you know, part of the thing in the book, what the boys talks about was like, as 
far as like what the long term interests are for folks, like folks fighting against like the long term interests of like humanity, right? Yeah, right. There's that, but like their the like day to day interests, they work right alongside their day to day interests. That was logical. Right? It was not like what they did was not like you can't look at it as just like ignorant like peasants, you know? No. Like they had, that was their like immediate day to day interest, right? As far as they perceived it, right? Right. So it's not like a, it's not an illogical thing for them, you know. Having, you know, lived through the Mexican War, having lived through the Global Wars and the First Seminole War and the Second Seminole War, right? And all the Indian Wars, right? It is not surprising, right, that the Ku Klux Klan arose immediately after the Civil War. It is not surprising that the northern, the northern like capitalists end up siding with the southern, the southern capitalists once again, right? It's not surprising that they utilize the fear of the white peasants and working class, you know, to, to halt that move, right? It was, it, what happened was what was logical to happen, right? Um, so I have no time left. Mm -hmm. Just a real person. Yeah, I have no time left. But. <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious, sticking with the boys for a second, on of these concepts. I think he talks about this book and definitely talk about other um, writings, but the, his kind of concept that we still use today, the wages of whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like that's what you're talking about. It's this, this bit of the surplus that racialized capital shares with white people in what we kind of roughly call privilege, you know, right? And he was talking about how it has this, uh, this certain sort of morbid equilibrium that it creates to like a state project or a economic project or a, or a land project. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if what you're saying makes me think that part of what Du Bois is proposing in Black Reconstruction is that there was this general crisis in that wage. Mm -hmm. That that wage actually for this moment, a very brief moment, maybe disappeared. That the contradictions mm -hmm. in the South, the, the, the um, transformation of the Civil War into a revolutionary war. Mm -hmm. And in a way, with all the little ingredients, maybe not necessarily, but the ingredients of a national liberation project, right? And as you showed, literally a national liberation project in, in the case of the video you showed. And just thinking about the potential, obviously there's the disaster, right? The counter revolution, mm -hmm. but thinking about those terms being helpful that there are these periods in which there is a crisis mm -hmm. in that, not just the, the, when we talk about revolution, we often think about it in terms of political power and maybe land and an economic system, but that social crisis, mm -hmm. the disappearance of that wage and the ways in which he's saying can go either way. And for this one clear moment, there's this way in which a lot of those contradictions, maybe not resolved, but uh, weighted through in, in, in ways that would have upended mm -hmm. um, white supremacy itself. Mm -hmm. Or at least he's calling that question. Right. Ways. Right. And like it was a it was an opportunity, you know, missed opportunity, but like, you know, that was that was like the closest like things that ever got, you know, towards towards like that liberal transformation. But folks, you know, the power of the power structure you know, wasn't going to allow that to happen. You know, they weren't going to allow that to, to see itself through in a particular way. So like, they immediately, you know, moved to, to squash it, you know, and subvert it and try to steer it in another direction, right? Because you're going to see in like some of the, the next chapters coming up, like some of the moves to, you know, to, you know, to settle places like, yeah. Can I, do you want to stay longer? Is the question? Do you want to stay beyond eight thirty?
No. Yeah. No. Should we wrap then, Rob? How, how, how burning is your question? I'll be very quick. I'll try to be. Um, we shouldn't be anachronistic in looking back at Civil War and Reconstruction. There was very little uh, political discourse, vision, concept of national liberation, collective liberation, socialism, anarchism, etc. And the self-determining uh, moves of the freed people helped to create that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think I mean, Robin Kelly, among others, was really emphasized that advancing a political imagination is a big step politically. And I, you know, that wasn't available then. They made a big step. We now can take advantage of it. But we can't criticize them for not seeing everything mm -hmm. that we see now. Right. Right on. Okay. Anyone else burning? All right. Can everybody just help me thank Sinyaka for joining?